Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're speaking with experts working in the field of substance abuse and addiction and how uh, on how their work gives hope to individuals struggling with alcohol and, of course, their families and communities. Our special guests today are Melanie Brown Woofter, President and CEO of the Florida Behavioral Health Association, and Anna Foglia, CEO of Sun Street Centers. Thank you so much for joining us, Melanie. Uh, it's just great to see you, Anna. It's wonderful to have you here. And, and this is just such an important issue. Uh, I'm going to go first to, to you, Melanie. I'm going to uh, set you up with this, this sort of idea. Alcoholism is the most common addiction in the United States, and it is facilitated uh, by its social acceptability. The fact that we have uh, liquor stores in, in our grocery stores, um, we have uh, liquor stores uh, on uh, pretty much every corner in America. And uh, if you if you look at from a conservative perspective, uh, over 17 million Americans report um, uh, suffer from alcohol dependence or chronic alcohol abuse. It's just a huge, huge problem. So, uh, Melanie. Um, you're looking at me on this on this ca camera here. Mm -hmm. I'm a fairly fi high functioning or, uh, person. I run a I run a company. I have a responsible job. Um, I I socialize. I'm I'm in business. I do analysis. Could I be an alcoholic? Absolutely. You can certainly be a functioning alcoholic, not a problem. And um, Mark, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It's great to see you and Anna. Uh, and, you know, in terms of alcoholism, in addition to, you know, the liquor stores being on the corner, you know, alcohol is socially acceptable. We have a glass of wine with dinner. We have a beer when we watch the game. Uh, we have happy hour. You know, all, all of those are just kind of written into our culture and are certainly are acceptable. You know, and at some point, the use of alcohol um, does become abuse and, and can lead to an alcohol use disorder when um, alcohol begins to drive your decisions. I need to drink before I do this. I, um, uh, you know, you can't function unless you uh, have a drink in the morning, have a drink in the evening, have a drink, you know, late into the night. And sometimes the onset that is insidious. Uh, you know, it starts with one or two drinks at happy hour. And before you know it, you're having three or four or five or six. And this happens every night. Um, and then, you know, we are uh, we're caught up in the in the disorder uh, that's there. And so um, and 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 alcoholism, uh, as with many other diseases, have stages and you can be functioning like what you describe. Uh, it can also interfere with all of your relationships uh, socially, um, in business, you know, in your work, uh, and, you know, all the way to, you know, having liver cirrhosis and, and um, severe physical illnesses that require you to have, you know, assistance to live. So being an outwardly functioning uh, person um, doesn't immunize yourself from uh, the physical impacts, does it, Anna? No, it's also progressive. So, I mean, you may be functioning fine in your 20s and 30s, but, um, you know, things change as you get older, your body changes. And I think like Melanie said, there's both an objective and subjective piece to this. So objectively, you could go to the doctor, and he could check or she could check your blood work or your liver enzymes. But subjectively, are people telling you and you're not listening? Are you losing relationships? Did you get multiple DUIs or even one? I mean, there's a lot of, uh, do you drink alone? So there's a lot of um, ways that you can progressively get worse through the years. I'd like to talk a little bit about human beings and whether we are all predisposed to, to addiction. Um, is, is, is this um, an issue that we all suffer? One of the reasons that I'm asking is that um, we've been uh, listening for a while uh, about um, uh, this whole issue of addiction to these things. Mm -hmm. right? The, an addiction to likes. Now, we're all checking our phones multiple times a day, right? Why are we doing that? We must be getting something from checking, not just information, but we must be getting something from, from, from checking. Is the human brain such, uh, Melanie, that we are kind of predisposed to being uh, addicts just 
we 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 like the whatever the positive buzz that we get from serotonin levels or whatever it is, and um, we are kind of um, almost awaiting for something to come along that can hook in to that sort of good feeling. And it could be alcohol. It could be, a, you know, another drug. It could be a telephone. It could be a compliment. Are we kind of susceptible just by virtue of being human beings? And should that guide our behavior, particularly in our education as we grow up, so that we are better equipped to deal with that aspect of who we are? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, almost all of our training from the time that we're born is based on reward. Uh, you know, you do the right thing, you get a reward. You engage in this behavior, there's a reward. Same thing, you know, with the cell phones that you're talking about. Um, uh, the dopamine is really serotonin, endorphins. You know, people who are long distance runners or engage in exercise, uh, you know, feel that that high, if you will, um, afterwards. And so there are many, many things that we become, you know, addicted to, or at least we want, we see Seek the um, feeling that engaging in that behavior um, gives us. And that includes substances like alcohol, opioids, you know, all, all of that um, is along the, along the same gamut for sure. And Anna, how, do, how do we deal with that? How do we, how do we help um, our kids from very, very young ages? How do we help them uh, prepare for that aspect? I mean, we don't want to start off our children with with fear, uncertainty, doubts, so oh, the world is a scary place, distrust everything and everyone. But but it seems that that we could do a better job of of equipping uh, our young people for what is about to come as they hit uh, puberty and the young years, you know, the 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 uh, happy hour years, the party years and so on. How do we, how do we deal with that? Well, you know, Mark, we were talking about this earlier. Addiction um, can be an addiction to sugar. It could be uh, addiction to shopping. And, and I think that it, empathy and education and what we're doing now is one way, you know, to address this because say 10% of the population is addicted to alcohol and the other 90% are drinking and they don't understand it. And when they don't understand it, they think it's that person's behavioral problem and they don't need to um, really deal with it. And the truth is all of us are probably addicted to something. And if we can, you know, gain some understanding, maybe the training would be a little bit better for our teenagers. So we have a huge prevention program at Sun Street Centers and we're in multiple schools, in middle schools and high schools, but also in elementary schools. Because kids in elementary schools today also know what's going on with alcohol and drugs on the street. And um, there is a, a great permissive um, feeling that from a parent's point of view, if I'm watching my child as a teenager drink and I'm teaching them it's okay to drink in moderation, then I'm actually doing them a service. And that you're not doing them a service at all because the brain is still developing up into age 25. And so allowing kids to drink even small amounts um, is really giving them permission to drink any amount, any time. I mean, we survey teens all the time. We have a really strong after-school program for teens and they all say the same thing. You know, it all started with some adult, whether it was a coach encouraging them to have a glass of beer after they won a game or uh, at a family event and watching their own um, adult brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles drinking. Um, the, the onset, the early onset of um, alcohol use is a predictor of addiction, you know, as an adult. So one thing that you do is you do the, you do education, uh, right, Anna and Melanie, uh, talk a little bit about your your education programs. So I'm going to look at other aspects of of what you do. Melanie, could you talk a little bit about your educational uh, elements? Here? Well, sure. Well, as Anna said, prevention is key, and so be able to provide young people with a means to build self esteem so that they can have confidence in themselves um, and in self image. You know, because we know with social media. And, uh, you know, just the, the wide, the unending visual images that are available to young people, they compare themselves to what they see on screen. It can, can lead to some problems, which then you know, causes them to perhaps to engage in using substances at an earlier age. Uh, and so we really want to be able to help 
kids to, um, like I said, have a better self-image um, of themselves or a strong self-image and then teach them decision making skills, too, so that they can understand some of the consequences and, and make it OK to say no. Instead of everybody has to give in and say this, if you're at a party and everybody's doing it, then you feel compelled to. But, you know, give them the tools that they can say no um, when the time comes. And as parents, you know, being examples, as Anna said, too, you know, maybe you do have a glass or two of wine or you have a drink on the weekends. um, But, you know, kind of not letting the kids have that until they're a little bit older. And in terms of cell phones, we just we as parents have to put our cell phones down Mm -hmm. and spend time with our kids. You know, and that's the hardest thing for us to do as adults, because you are afraid that you're going to miss that email. You're going to miss that text. Oh, I have to see what's happening um, there. But putting our phones down and being um, with our children and engaging with them, you know, having game night, having uh, conversations at dinner, you know, all those sorts of things really do help um, in in the child's development. We were just asked by uh, one of our our, uh, viewers, um, what do you do with the shame, the guilt, and the social stigma that comes with admission of of having a problem. You know, if uh, I started off the show saying, could I be an alcoholic? I asked Melanie and Melanie said, absolutely, you could be a a high functioning alcoholic. Now, nobody, nobody, I will tell you, will want to employ um, someone who says that they are an alcoholic. Um, it just it, it just isn't. I, I, and I would not be able to earn my living if people identified me as an alcoholic. Right. And then there is a social uh, sh- a stigma and shame. Um, how do we deal with that? Because if if me being forthright about having a problem and then I'm in a social setting and then I'm worried that people might know might notice that I'm not drinking along with everyone else. Right, and I'm only I'm only having soda water or something, and and then I use that as an excuse to also drink. And how do we deal with that with that issue? Um, how do we deal with the shame? I mean, I'm going to challenge you and say, I don't believe in the premise of what you just said. I think okay. people will hire you. I think um, it's the fear of the unknown of your friends and family, and so what we encourage. Uh, early in recovery is to be around other people that are early in recovery. And that's what our system of social model is all about, is surrounding yourself with other successful people that are also in recovery, following the 12-step model. But I think you can be a leader in your friends and family by saying, hey, you know, I'm in recovery and I'm not drinking. I'm happy to be your designated driver and taking that stigma away. We do have job developers that find jobs for people all the time. And the, the employers know where they're coming from. And the point is that you'd be surprised how many people have this issue in their family and they don't share it. So the only way the stigma is going to be broken is by one person at a time. Just sharing that it's okay. I'm fine. Just because I don't drink, I'm still having a good time and I'm happy to be with you. And um, it makes the people around them relax as well. But but Anna, I'll defend my premise. You know, as as someone who recruits leaders, uh, chief executives, and other leaders for organizations, there are those attitudes that you describe, which are which are very embracing. But there are also the other attitudes um, that that um, that um, make it very difficult for people to openly admit. Uh, Melanie, just same question to you. How how do you see this this whole issue of of us, you know, in society? Uh, having a, a, an understanding of others and conveying that understanding in a way that reduces shame, reduces stigma, and that allows people to deal with their problem in real time as they're also undertaking a job. Mm-hmm. Um, I would agree with Anna. I would kind of challenge that um, assumption because I really think the stigma is lessening and that more people are actually talking about it and having conversations. Every family in America has been impacted by alcoholism, every family. You know, whether it's a cousin, an uncle, a dad, a mom, you know, a teenager, every, every family has been impacted. And, so, and and for many, many years or up until just recently, um, it's been taboo to talk about it. Um, it's something that you hide. You don't let people know about. Um, but in the last few years, we've been more open. We are discussing uh, you know, opioid use. We're discussing alcohol use. Uh, out, and, and people are recognizing that it is a problem. It is a medical illness. 
And, you know, it's a physical condition. It's not just something you choose. Um, it's not a behavior that you that you choose to engage in. That is actually a medical diagnosis. And that has really helped to lessen the stigma. And it has also um, the other thing that's helped is that the availability of services and that it's OK to not be OK. And it's OK to seek a service and to seek help for the problem that's there. Um, and I want to challenge you, too, that if you an employer, we are a forgiving people. And if you are in recovery and say, I'm an alcoholic, I'm recovering, the chances of you getting the job are very are high, are very good. So, yeah, and Mark, I'm just going to add that I know you're recruiting CEOs. And so there's probably a time and the place to talk about your disability. And that may not be the time when you're interviewing for a job, nor should you have to. So um, I think it does start in, in sharing during social social engagements with family and friends and coworkers and going from there. It's so it's so interesting what you're saying. First of all, I love being corrected by people who are smarter than me. It makes me smarter. There's there is hope for me yet. Um, but but I, I think what you're what you're both saying is that it starts with actually uh, talking about it in a in a forthright way. If we allow ourselves and our voices to be suppressed, we promote shame. In a sense, we're talking about the obligation that we each have to just be forthright. I grew up surrounded by people, some of whom were addicted to substances, to alcohol and other substances. And I think that all of us have that kind of story. If we just sort of looked around and we looked at our, you know, uh, our relatives or the, the friends or our circle, there, there was always somebody or many multiple people who had a, who had an issue. Um, and, and so it isn't that strange. Maybe the, the time is just to to uh, bring this out. Uh, how do you deal with cultural uh, issues? It was another another question. How do you deal with uh, the, the differences in different communities where there are difference differences in how um, addiction is viewed um, uh, as opposed to employment situations. You know, we live uh, here in the salad bowl of the country in uh, central California, central coast of California. So I have a high level of our clients come from Mexico or Central America. And um, it is shameful talking about shame to share your problems or ask for help. Uh, plus, they come from very hardworking families. So they're working, you know, three, four o'clock on the bus, working in the field six or seven at night so their kids can go to college and make it a better life for themselves. And there's a high level of alcoholism um, with that kind of level of labor. And um, it, it, it is something where we have to engage the family members. We have this program called Family Empowerment that engages friends and family of the person that we're treating to learn what to do when the person leaves. So, you know, maybe you do have to change your lifestyle a little bit to accommodate your loved one. That's something that um, they look at. And there, you know, we, so we bring the families in on the weekends and, and we do things together, have fun together without alcohol and drugs to just show that you can do that. So there's going to be that level of um, concern, the different kinds of, um, cultures that we work with for sure, but there's ways to address it. Mm -hmm. and, and I would agree with Anna too. And, and you have to respect the culture of the individual. We really, our providers really work hard at um, being able to hire uh, professionals that look like the population they're serving so that there's a level of trust when you come in. You also have to look at the different cultures and sometimes, um, you know, because it's, it's taboo with, with, with many, um, many cultures to, to discuss um, any kind of substance use disorder. And so the church, you know, or, uh, you know, the place of worship, the priest to the, uh, are the keys to this. And so once you get um, that entity in, engaged um, into um, some of the peer work, you know, the recovery work, um, it, it, it provides a path for recovery and for remaining in recovery. You know, it's very interesting. We just uh, are completing a, a poll in which we asked uh, who should be responsible for those who assist with alcohol abuse. And we've got uh, a, a whole number of different responses, right? Churches, nonprofits, communal organizations, government, uh, by providing funding and so on and so forth. Everybody agreed that 
uh, employers and providing insurance and medical leave is really important. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a question about that. Um, do is how insurance, employment insurance, you know, health insurance, is that does that really deal with the preventive and the uh, the treatment uh, parts of addiction in a way that you think is appropriate? Are these medical plans, um, do they provide the kind of support to addicts that, that are required, Anna? I was uh, interested that you're pulled and asked about the medical profession as one of the choices, because I, I think it lies in the hands of doctors and hospitals. And honestly, I do feel that they are woefully, um, very sorely uneducated in substance abuse. Um, there's some new medical professionals now that are starting to learn about addiction, but in general, it's overlooked in the medical profession. Um, so your question was, I'm sorry, repeat your question one more time. Um, well, I, I think you made an actual, uh, you know, oh, a, insurance a, companies, a, I know. Better, better point, right? I was asking about insurance companies and you say, yes, but what about the doctors? But yeah. let's, <laughs> let's talk about the entire uh, medical insurance, healthcare, Right. Um, I mean, insurance companies are like everything else. Uh, some people have better insurance than others. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, Medi-Cal or Medicaid, depending on what state you're in, has only now come into oh. parity with mental health services and started supporting substance abuse treatment. Oh, I don't know, four years ago, mm -hmm. it was there wasn't funding for substance abuse treatment. It was seen as, um, Melanie alluded to, just a behavioral problem that you chose rather than a behavior that is a result of a medical condition. And so, so because you chose it, it wasn't insured. In, in Florida, do you have the same kind of a, a, a of an issue uh, now in terms of how? Uh, sure. So it depends on the commercial policy, whether it's a Medicaid policy, uh, you know, Medicare. Uh, you know, all those entities are just beginning to take this seriously and realizing that the dollars that they put in um, for treatment and services actually yield a better outcome from them because you know insurance is all actuarial based, uh, and so when you can do some preventative work or um, expend dollars on treatment and services that saves you on the deep end, uh, you know, from that crisis care, that cirrhosis, um, then the insurance carriers are more likely to, um, to cover that. And we also know that the longer someone is in treatment in an outpatient situation, the better they're going to do. If they go to an inpatient facility for 20 days or 30 days and then get out and are just back into their environment, they are likely not going to be successful and stay in recovery. If they can continue continue maybe an outpatient program for six months, um, then the chances of success and remaining in recovery are exponentially higher than without those supports. And those supports are low cost. A lot of this is peer run, um, volunteer, you know, that sort of thing. So as long as they have access to that support in the community, it leads to um, remaining in recovery. I'd like to talk just very briefly about this idea of self-medication versus prescribed medication. Um, if, if as we grow older, we live in, in uh, psychic pain, in other words, the, the stresses accumulate in terms of our, you know, how we think and, and what is going on in our head and physical pain, right? We have, we have a hurt shoulder and then we have a hurt knee. And then, you know, as we get older, just sort of pain becomes part and parcel of what we do, um, or how we live. How do we deflect from this use of substances, whether it is opioids, where we have an opioid addiction uh, issue, or substances like alcohol or other, um, other uh, drugs that we voluntarily take. How do we, we deflect from, from that when we, we might have a real issue or several real issues in terms of our, our psychic need and our physical needs? Melanie, what, what is your answer there? Um, well, you know, we live in a, a time, you know, in a culture where there's always a pill for that. You want to lose weight, you take a pill. You have a headache, you take a pill. You, um, you know, need nutrition, you take a pill. Uh, so that they, and we also um, are a society who needs instant gratification. So instead of being able to work to something, you know, like on our phones, you instantly have to have it. So I need a pill. I need something now rather than being able to address in a longer you know, term uh, manner how to to deal with that pain. Maybe we could do yoga and some relaxation rather than taking a pill. So um, it, it, it 
And then one thing that we haven't talked about is that there is a number of individuals who come into addiction based because of trauma that they've experienced. And almost everyone who has a substance use disorder also has an underlying mental health issue. And so being able to address those underlying issues and sort of, you know, unpack our emotional issues that have maybe tied to um, the substance that we're using is really, really important. Um, and that is, that's the key. Are we talking about going back to some very old and tried and true uh, habits? Uh, prayer, meditation, exercise, old-fashioned discipline. Old-fashioned uh, disciplines that certainly are supportive and certainly help to keep us in recovery for sure. And talking talking things through with uh, with friends and families or even with a stranger who might be equipped to help. Anna, how do, how do you see it? If, we, if we're kind of built from the ground up to, to – um, to be addicted in certain ways. If we're built from the ground up to suffer pain and wanting to alleviate those pains. Those are natural, natural occurrences. How do we deal with that and deflect from uh, addiction of alcohol and other subsequent uh, substances that can temporarily solve our problem, but but on the long term harm us? Do we go back to old fashioned methods? Well, like you said, as we get older, we're either going to get much better at self-care or or not. And one of the issues we see is people, if they lose a partner earlier, um, they start to isolate. People that isolate, um, their mental health issues become worse. There are people that get into alcoholism who always drank normally their whole lives. And then in their 60s, they start drinking because they're lonely. Um, yes, there are basic things like, exercise and meditation and journaling and reading, reading something positive and supportive, being with friends is terribly important. Even if uh, your best friend is a dog. I, I have, I walk my dogs every morning before work. I got a dog that absolutely had to be walked to force me to walk. And it's the best start of my day. And so these are basic principles that I think people forget about. Pain can be um, addressed in multiple ways um, that are not a pill. I, sensory centers, we're, we're really not into medically assisted treatment. There is medically assisted treatment and we support it. But in terms of titrating off of it and learning how to live um, in remission from your uh, addiction is, is kind of our goal. So maybe some of the older fashioned um, approaches to living um, have merit uh, for us. We can start off with education. We can start off with counseling. We can equip our children, our youth, and our adults to recognize signs and, and respond to them. We can create organizations like yours that can that can uh, uh, be responsive to the, to the needs of addicts and their families. But we can also go back to some key values that, that uh, sustain us through, through the millennia and and try and and think about our own self-care in a different way. Melanie Brown Wolfter, President and CEO of the Florida Behavioral Health Association, and Anna, Anna Foglia, uh, CEO of Sun Street Centers, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us, sharing your knowledge. Please thank your your folks, your your staff, your boards, your funders, and your clients. Your clients are part of the solution because so often those clients, as they become more equipped, part of their healing is to not only heal themselves, but also share their knowledge with others who have similar issues. Thank no you. shame, right? No right. shame. Let's deal with it together. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mark.